So hello everyone, welcome to uh, January Fundamentals. Thanks for coming out. So we're gonna kick off the new year with uh, Chris Almanza, and he's gonna be uh, talking about uh, the history of Chinese astronomy. So I think it's nice that we have uh, some various topics that we can cover here uh, with fundamentals. Uh, and uh, it, it's nice to have a little bit uh, of something of this nature because uh, you know we've all been out we've seen things like the um, crab nebula and we only know that it was a supernova remnant from having records from the, the Chinese right that indicated uh, that this thing exploded in uh, uh, 1000 or so AD so uh, things from the past can be helpful for us in the present too in many ways. So anyway, uh, Chris, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. All right, uh, I have two goals. Hello everybody, first of all, sorry. I have two goals tonight. First of all is to not put you to sleep, okay? Or, you know, bore you to tears. And if you get up and walk out, I'm fine with that. Uh, second is to try not to sound like uh, you know, like a grade schooler or a high schooler doing like, what did I do for my summer vacation? So that still may happen because that's basically what this is, except for it was more like, I'm going to get my wife because she was in China. <laughs> and uh, why I went to get her, I happened to take advantage of that time to go visit uh, a pretty significant place in uh, Beijing. And so that's kind of what started me down this whole process and uh, unfortunately, my pictures that I will be showing later tonight, again, the, what I did for summer uh, part, are kind of bad, because, bad quality because I just had a point and shoot at that time and I didn't have a high quality camera, so I tried to improve them as best as possible, but uh, forgive me if the imaging, image quality isn't that great on the screen. I also wanted to take a, a perspective, uh, uh, something we're all more familiar with, right? So I wanted to start uh, talking about the history of astronomy in general that most of us are probably familiar with. I know it's what I was educated on, uh, which is like more of a European slant. And um, I was kind of, I was pleasantly surprised, I guess, uh, to find out there's a lot of disconnect between uh, what happened in Europe in general and then what happened over in China and the city. So that's what I, did. I wanted to put this together in a timeline fashion, so I'm just going to jump right into this and hopefully this will go pretty quick, folks. Um, but if you have questions, I'll try to answer them and by no means am I any expert on a lot of these topics. There's probably people out there in the audience who know them better than I do. Alright, so we'll start back in the time with 2000 BCE where, uh, and if you guys can read this, it's amazing, that's great, you got good eyes. <laughs> but uh, that's a PowerPoint thing, uh, it's called Screen Tips. Anyway. Supposedly Mesopotamia priests, uh, they were keeping records of the heavenly motions. And then, uh, I got this timeline, by the way, from a site. I can give it to anybody if they want to look at it later. It's, it was, looks like someone's dissertation or something like that. But anyway, uh, so he only has a blurb on this very first point. I'm pointing it out now because I'll come back to it in a little bit later. India and China observe stars and plants. And that's all he said. That's it. There was nothing else. And then all the rest of his timeline was European-centered. And I was like, yeah, okay, that's, you know, that's what I'm familiar with. Like I said, that's what I was educated. So clear back in 2000 BCE, people were doing that kind of astronomy already, right? They're already recording it. Then we come down to 1500, we have um, people who actually recorded the constellations. Uh, and several different, you know, uh, cultures came up with their own constellations. They drew their own lines on the sky. The length of the day of the year, uh, uh, month and year were known to a lot of cultures, okay? Even clear back in 1500 BCE. And most people uh, at that time also were at least conscious of the five visible naked eye planets, okay? So I was surprised at that because I was like, I thought, well, we'll get to that in a second, right? And I think you all know probably where I'm going with that statement, but back in 600 BCE, there's a guy named Anax. I'm gonna butcher a lot of Greek names tonight and a lot of Chinese names, so I apologize to everybody on that. Annex Mander, I think is how you say that. He is a Greek, he notated the pole stars, so he's familiar with the circumpolar type stars. Uh, he knew that there was a changing star field going from north to south. He knew that the, the sky basically was shifting. He could determine that. 
And, uh, but he kind of had it wrong where he thought this, uh, the world was a cylinder and the sky was a sphere. So it was kind of a, I don't know, like a silo. Uh, so that was his concept of what our world uh, existed within. And that was clear back in 600 BCE. 500 BCE, we have this guy down here, uh, Pythagoras. Most of us are familiar with Pythagorean theorem. Uh, he knew Earth was a sphere. I was like, again, really, I was surprised. I had forgotten that they knew this back in the old ancient days. Uh, motions of the planets is mathematically based, but he also kind of took a wrong turn and said, somehow it's related to music. I always thought that, I didn't know that one either. I was like, I don't know why. And how he related it to the timing, I'm assuming, of music and how, I guess. I don't know, Pythagoras, a lot of these guys had some crazy little uh, side notes to their, to their discoveries. This guy, Heraclides, in 350 BC, he knew the Earth was rotating on its axis, giving us a full day. So again, knows about a globe, knows about the globe. Um, 330 BC, we have this guy down here, Aristotle. Most of us know Aristotle, mostly about his philosophy, probably. But he came up with the whole concept of the aether, uh, the fifth element, which, again, most of us have heard about. Um, uh, he uh, did have a few things wrong. He, knew the, he thought the orbits of the planets, because they were heavenly bodies, were circles, perfect circles. And uh, that light travels infinitely fast, so again, not quite right. And uh, he thought that the Earth and the heavens had different rules. So again, you know, not quite right, but he's starting down the right path, right? Then we jump over here to 250 BC. We got two guys. We got this guy down here, which most of us probably have heard of. This is Eratosthenes. Uh, most of us have probably heard him from uh, about him from Carl Sagan back in the day, where he's the one who calculated the Earth's circumference uh, based on a very simple concept of the angle of some shadows of uh, pillars in Egypt. So that's what he did, and he was within one percent accuracy. It's pretty amazing for just simple tools and observation. And again, uh, that, that's that clip from Carl Sagan's Cosmos series, the original one. I love that and I can watch it every time. I can watch the entire little clip every time. Uh, it's amazing that the Eratosthenes figured that out in 250 BC. So up here though, we have someone named Aristarchus. Some of us might also know him. He was kind of famous. He measured the distance to the moon and he knew, uh, or he was trying to measure the distance to the moon, excuse me. And he, he had a good idea that it was at least a quarter of the size of the Earth. So he had already started to figure out that whole angular size idea, concept, right? Again, 250 BC, um, he tried to do the sun, but he couldn't quite get the math right. So probably because he thought it was a lot closer than it really was. And um, he could only get within 5% error. I mean, to me, that, for me, my math skills, <laughs> not that good probably i probably didn't even get it within that and again he he proposed that the earth does go around the sun this is back in 250 bc but of course it wasn't adopted for 1800 years so not in europe at least um now we had 140 bc we had Hipparchus. again there's a nasa mission called Hipparchus, i believe uh, i forgot what it's doing though. i don't know if anybody knows what that is but he basically came up with the trigonometry he invented the math for trigonometry so he, he started refining things like the sun, moon distance. He mapped over a thousand stars. Uh, and again, um, uh, Newton and uh, I think Huygens too, both used his uh, star maps to do some of their proofs. So again, eight, but it took 1800 years for someone to realize that he had already had the, he had already done all the work, or the legwork at least, right? They needed to do the, the math work. Uh, he did figure out there's a, a tropical year as opposed to a sidereal year. And again, I wasn't quite aware of the difference between the two. It's a subtle difference. It's basically a 20 minute difference, right? And, for, and it also infers the precession of the equinoxes. So uh, again, that's 140 BC. So at this point, it's weird because in Europe, things clearly start taking a turn for the worse. We'll see here in a second, right? Uh, we get this guy right here. Uh, or no, I'm sorry, the next step. Uh, so the Silicus, Silicus? I don't know how you say that one. Uh, moon, he figured out that the moons were probably the uh, biggest influence on the tides. Again, figured that out. 1800 years later, they finally believed him. Did, but it took that long before, they real, before it was realized. 
and actually used in, in practice. So this is where things start taking a uh, turn for the worse. Uh, this guy, Poseidonus, I guess, Poseidonus, uh, he recalculates Earth's circumference, but only 70% correct. How did Eratosthenes get it within 1%? And this guy's only getting 70%. Somewhere along the way, right, it seems like they've lost their skills to do the math or whatever, I don't know. And he only got the sun size with only 43% accuracy, even way worse than what, again, Eratosthenes and some of the other earlier guys were doing. So things are starting to turn around, and he also starts popularizing astrology. So people are starting to take more faith uh, perspective towards, um, towards astronomy. And then we have this guy here, uh, Ptolemy, which most of us, again, have heard about. Uh, his big contribution, of course, was writing the Amalgust, which, again, hopefully some of us have heard about. The Amalgust basically was a summation of all these ancient uh, history and, and findings, and he put it all together. So that was one of his greatest contributions to astronomy. Um, and he also had the Earth at the center, so he wasn't still quite right, but uh, it, and he also believed that our orbits were circular. He only thought the stars were like 200 times further away uh, than the planets. So again, he still, they still had to figure things out, but he did create the longitude and latitude concept. And again, it wasn't adopted though for 1800 more years. So weird. Why we would uh, ignore that? Why? Because of this. 476 to 1000. That's the dark ages, and this is why. So my concept when I started putting this together was, how did we have all this ancient knowledge and then we lost it because of one period of time? Only what, 600, a little less than 600 years of time, and the Europeans just totally forgot all this knowledge and would end up having to rediscover it all, and so, that leads to what's gonna happen in China. Um, so, but then of course we have people like this guy coming along, Copernicus, most people are familiar with his face, knows that the sunset, he creates the whole sunsetter model. And we go to people like Taco Brahe, he sees a Nova, realizes it's not a star, or, or realizes it's not near us, I'm sorry, and uh, that the heavens actually do change. That they're not you know, set in stone by the gods or whatever. And, uh, and not all motion is circular. So he also knows that. So again, that's kind of like heresy, right? Already starting that concept. Then we have 1596, David, uh, some of these people I didn't, I hadn't heard before, like this guy, David Fabricius, Fabricius, maybe? I don't know. He studied Omicron SETI. Uh, oh, I realize I have a second eye in there now. It is a uh, variable star, uh, and that the, he, again, has proof that, look, the star, the, the heavens are changing. They're not <coughs> static. They're not set in stone. But this guy, this guy down here is the one who paid the price, right? Giordano Bruno. Uh, he also knew that uh, the Earth and the Sun move, both of them move, not just the Earth or not just the Sun or not just the stars or planets. He knew both the Earth and the Sun moved. And uh, he, he, although he did think the Earth, uh, universe was infinite, but who knows? We still don't know, right? We're still not 100% sure if it's infinite or not. It, uh, it's starting to go that way, but who knows? Uh, but of course, he's like I said, he's the one who paid the price for all this heresy, and he was the one who got burned at the stake for it. And then, of course, we're going to jump to 1610 with both. Uh, I'll get the main guy next. Somebody, and some of you might have heard Simon Marius too. The new uh, uh, cosmos, I think, covered Simon Marius a little bit, if I remember right. I, I think I've watched most of the episodes, if not all of them. Uh, so he was one of the first to observe the Andromeda galaxy. Of course, he called it a nebula, so he thought it was a nebula instead of a galaxy. Uh, but uh, he was one of those first people with this guy, of course, Galileo, who started t aiming his telescope instead of at the land, and who's approaching my land to invade, he started aiming it up at the sky. We all are familiar with Galileo, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on him. Um, most of us know Kepler, too. Uh, he also determined that the uh, orbits of the planets were uh, elliptical. And uh, he was kind of the first person who realized the size of the solar system. He had a good idea because he could clearly see the five uh, naked eye planets and uh, could do, uh, determine the math for those. Uh, then there's this guy I've never heard about, uh, Jeremiah Horrocks in 1639. Uh, he sees uh, the Venus transit of the sun. So again, now he's everybody's starting to get the realization that 
the, you know, the planets are different orbits around the sun, and then he also gets the concept, or he starts coming up with the idea of parallax, that at different times of the year, the position of the sun and the planets are gonna be in different positions. So he, he, he uh, that's one of his contributions, is he kind of come, came up with that concept of being able to use parallax to, to determine uh, distances. <coughs> Uh, and then there's this guy, Godfrey Winland. Again, this is another one I hadn't heard about. He recalculates uh, Aristarchus, one of those ancients that we talked about earlier, distance between the Earth and the Sun, and he gets it 60% correct value. Not bad. I mean, that's 93 million miles, and 60% is pretty, pretty decent with that. But still not quite right, but pretty good. And finally, we have 1650. We have, oops, G again, I'm going to butcher this one, Giovanni. Riccioli, I guess. He's kind of one of those uh, people that identified what a, a double star actually is. The other guy, Omicron Seti guy, he, he watched it, but he didn't realize that they were tied together. Okay, this guy, he, this uh, Riccioli uh, identified that it is a double star, that they're made it together in some fashion. Then, of course, we got these two guys to kind of finish up here with the European history. We got good old Christian Huygens. He kind of had some of those crazy ideas too. Um, he uh, he saw Saturn's uh, rings. He was one of the first ones. He saw the moon of Saturn. He saw Titan, and uh, real, uh, he realized it had a ring. Right, and Saturn had a ring. Uh, he could tell Orion Nebula was some kind of a different object. He, I don't know if he really understood what it was exactly, but he knew it was different than a lot of other things he had been looking at uh, through the telescope. And then, of course, we had Mr. Newton, and I figured who better to end the European history on is one of the brightest guys in our history, right? Uh, good old Newton, calculus inventor, whatever else you want to attribute to the guy, he did everything, right? So most of these guys, like I said, we're all familiar with, or at least have heard their names, whether it's from a NASA mission or not. Uh, but it was lost, right? It had to be regained, and so all that ancient knowledge had to be regained by the later guys. But like I said, what about that very first date, right? It just had that mention of India and China uh, notating the stars and planets, right? Well, what does that mean exactly? So um, let's take a little closer look. And again, the only reason I'm focusing on the Chinese is because I was in China. <laughs> if I went to India, I'd probably be doing a talk about India's his, uh, astronomy <laughs> history. So we'll get rid of these guys, basically. So it's a not so familiar uh, perspective. What I've done is add a little cheat sheet in my presentation here so that if we ever have any questions about dynasties in China, <laughs> which is a very involved uh, uh, topic, uh, you can click over here, pops up a little history dynasty, <laughs> giving you information if you need it. But I try to notate it for the most part in the rest of my talk. But if anybody has questions, we can try to look it up. Um, so again, 200 BC, 2000 BC, so now a millennia is a pretty wide range, <laughs> I thought, but that's what the placard said in China. It said anywhere between 4,000 and 5,000 there were poems being written in China that notated that uh, the planets were moving and that Venus specifically was mentioned in one of, the, uh, in one of their uh, poems. Uh, how it moved against the background sky. So they knew that the heavens were moving and changing and stuff like that. Uh, and it, it applied not just to Venus, though. He applied, they apply, it applied to all the planets, that they're all doing that, that they're in a different orbit, basically. So 770, 476 BC, uh, recognized as first record sun activity. This is, they started recording sun activity that far back, back in 476. They're uh, supposedly, and I, I still didn't see, I don't remember seeing how they recorded the sunspots. I'm assuming it's some kind of a magic box type thing, you know, where you pip, do the whole uh, pinhole and you get the image of the sun on the ground. I'm assuming that's how they did it, but I never did see a diagram of how they were recording sunspots back then. I'm assuming they weren't looking directly at it. It didn't have mylar film back then, but they had some system to do it that way, I'm assuming. But they supposedly recorded over 200 sunspots. They could see solar prominences. Again, how did they do this? I don't know. Mostly because they recorded over a thousand eclipses up until the Qing Dynasty. And this is kind of why I put that cheat cheat sheet. The Qing Dynasty came came all the way up to 1919. Okay, so it, for all that time, they recorded over a thousand eclipses. So 
pretty impressive. But then again, there's, there was a big gap, and either I missed a section of the museum that I was at, <laughs> or they just didn't record a lot during the next quite a bit of time here. Uh, so we're going to jump to the next one. We're going to get rid of all the European guys again. And we're going to, of course, start over here before the Dark Ages with this gentleman. Um, his name, I'm again apologizing for the Chinese. My wife, would, you would think, would help me, but she did. <laughs> uh, Zhang Heng, uh, he was around in the Han Dynasty. Uh, he created two important documents in China. Uh, one was the, called the Theory of the Sphere Heaven. So they were starting to think about how the, the heavens work differently than things here on Earth. Uh, he also invented an armillary sphere, and we'll talk about that in a second, and a seismometer. So uh, interesting that, again, they were very attuned, clearly attuned to uh, nature. So what is an armillary sphere, right? That's an armillary <laughs> sphere. It's basically a model of objects in the sky uh, on a celestial sphere. So this, this object creates a celestial sphere up in the sky. It can be centered on the Earth or the Sun, so it can be either equatorial or elliptical. Okay, so there's different models. And the one, the one I'm standing in front of over there in the far le upper left is uh, one. It's one of the earlier ones that was built. And then this one down here, we'll kind of talk about again uh, in a little bit. But uh, what I was amazed, of course, or I found highly interesting, was a couple of things. First, I love the beauty of the thing. It's just gorgeous. It's made in bronze, clearly. Uh, but they got the dragons. They got these outposts, which I believe represent either mountains or clouds. And I think it's the clouds. And, but they have no functional impact, right? There's nothing you're going to gain from having the dragons on there or the clouds or whatever. And you can see where I'm standing that those four pillars have, they're not even attached to the, the armillary sphere itself. But again, that's, that's what kept hitting my head over and over. I'm like, look how beautiful these things are. Not only are we doing functional use for, finding a functional use for them, but we're also going to make them look nice. Because it's in the capital city, right? Eventually, it's in the capital city. Uh, another thing is if, again, on my horrible pictures, you might be able to see them right here, and definitely down on the far left corner there, uh, you can see the tick marks. They were clearly marking altitude and uh, 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 azimuth and altitude, right? Am I getting that right? Declination and azimuth. So um, that's what an armillary sphere is. So it was used for diff many different things, uh, mostly tracking things, celestial objects. All right, so we'll go back here. So this guy created that thing. He came up with the concept for it. Uh, you had this guy come up next, 429. Again, we're right now, we're starting the start of the uh, Dark Ages in Europe. This guy's name was Zhu Chongji. I think I got Zhu Chongji. I think I got that right. Uh, he calculated pi with amazing accuracy. Amazing accuracy, realized precession of the equinoxes. He, he, he was notated for that. And he also came up with the concept of the tropical year. So he, he got pretty close on exactly how long the tropical year is versus the sidereal year. Um, and of course, like I said, we could look at the dynasties. He was, um, I didn't put his dynasty, but we could look at that up, up over there, but that's not necessary. And this guy, clearly a monk, you can tell by his clothing. But uh, his name, Ying, Yi Jing, again, hopefully I got that right. Tang Dynasty, he in, in, uh, innovated the armillary sphere. So not only are we making these awesome things to track the skies, but we're gonna keep making them better and better and better and better, all right? So he innovated it, corrected the solar term, 24 solar terms. And I had to look it up, I was like, what the heck is 24 solar terms? And I'll get a little bit more into that. Let me finish his uh, basic uh, things. Uh, but, and it's based on the sun movement. Uh, he was in charge of terrestrial and astronomical surveys. So again, they were notating everything uh, natural but on Earth, but also in the heavens. So again, he was uh, charged by the dynasty, the ruling dynasty at that time, which was the Tang Dynasty. Uh, to do the survey. So uh, he also got, now this one I'm not sure about either. This is another one that I was kind of confused about. It said, measure the length of a portion of the meridian. I'm like, how do you measure the meridian? 
I guess you could do it by altitude, right, or something like that. But I also wondered, because being a monk, and there was a picture nearby that had the idea of the meridian being your pressure points in your body. So maybe that's what he did. I'm not sure how it applied. And often on these placard translations, English to Chinese translations often were pretty bad. They were, they were for the most part, pretty, they were okay. But they, there were some that were clearly like, that is not what they meant to say. Okay, so I'm not sure what that meant, unless someone else has an idea of how you would measure a meridian, other than the altitude. There are meridians on the Earth, too. That's true, I guess. You, you, you didn't have... Yeah, yeah, like you're talking like longitude, right? In that right. Um, yeah, okay. So maybe that's what he did? I don't know. Uh, all right, so what exactly... Uh, this, uh, this is clearly a focus of everything they created. Uh, they had a lot of clocks. They kept a lot of detailed information about time. Whether it was over there, the very cute little bunny uh, water, <laughs> water clock, which I just loved it. I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, then they, of course, have the big uh, sundial there. And then this one over here, this is the moon dial. Uh, the Chinese moon dial. So it's used at night to tell what time of uh, night it is. So you would aim it at the moon and it would tell you how, what time of night it was. Uh, then again, another giant, uh, this one down here is a giant, uh, again, uh, uh, clock for the day. So there was a piece that went over the top. It's kind of hard to see in my image. Uh, but uh, you could maybe barely make out that there's uh, tick marks here basically ch keeping track of the time on where the shadow fell would tell you what time of day it was. But it was giant, that thing's huge. It was like at least 15 feet long or something like that, it was huge. I could barely get it in my image. Then they also had this, the star dial. So again, keeping track of time at night, you aim, if you know the known star that you're using to track time, you would point, point this at it and you would know what time it is. So again, very, very uh, concerned and interested about timing things based on the heavens. Uh, this also, I'll come back to this one in a second. This is another uh, water water clock. So that's what that that guy he was promoting a lot of that information gathering, and um, so um, I think I forgot something on that previous one. So let me go back to it real quick here. Yeah. Okay. So remember, I said, what the heck is a twenty-four solar term, right? This is what this 24 solar term is. It's basically uh, used to let the farmers of China know when they're supposed to do things in their fields, okay? And they still use it today. I asked my wife, I said, by the way, do you know what this is? And she, at first she was like, no, I don't remember learning that. And then she's like, no, wait, I do remember that. They still learn it today uh, that they use it, this calendar, which is again, sun-based, right? You can maybe, I know this isn't the best of images down here, but it was kind of a last minute ad because I had to do, like I said, some research. And, but it's basically telling you when to plant, when to uh, harvest and such. So based on the position of the sun and they were keeping very strict tra track of that so that they would get the most yields for their crops. And, and what their crops, and some of that is based on what crop they're planting. So, and, uh, so the, this guy, that guy that we were looking at help refine that to make it more accurate based on the sun's position. Okay, so let's go back. This guy, he comes up, uh, I forget his name too, Shen Kuo, I hope I got that right. Head of astronomy during the Song Dynasty, he proved armillaries, and he's the one who designed the uh, Calypso, uh, Calypsidra, I think that's how they say it, clock and he created the calendar used for agriculture, which we were just talking about that. So again, this is the, uh, this is the Calypso, this one down here, this water clock is the Calyp Lotus Calypstra. Again, I'm probably butchering that name. But that's, again, he's, uh, the, the concept of them constantly refining and, and, and redesigning things is pretty amazing to me. It's just clear they did, weren't always happy with what they're, they weren't resting on their laurels. They kept building, and we're still, just now, right outside of the Dark Ages. So the Dark Ages in Europe are just starting to disappear. So, 
then I'm like, oh, well, guess what? I have to move all this over mm -hmm. because we've got to squeeze in a lot of the history before the, uh, the Europeans start doing it again. This guy, this guy, kind of like their Newton almost, I would say, or maybe Galileo or something like that. Um, his name's Guo Shuzhen, I think. Uh, established several observatories across the country. Uh, he devised and improved astronomical instruments, so he improved them again, that concept to keep them improving them. He adapted the armillary and improved the gnomon on their uh, solar calendar, or their solar clocks, right? So uh, he put basically what's a, a target. So it was like, not only do you know where the gnomon is, but you know exactly where the gnomon is. So it's trying to nail that time down exactly as much as possible. Uh, he also created what's called the Hemispherium Sundial. Uh, I don't even remember seeing an image of it. I just wish they would have, because it sounds interesting, right? Some kind of a sphere that tracks the sun, I don't know. But anyway, so he uh, created that. Uh, he also created one of the calendars that got used the longest in China. It was called the Shushi calendar. And he got the days uh, calculated to 365.2524 days long which is still pretty much what we all still use, right? That's why we do the leap year, the quarter, 0 0.25. Um, uh, and again, it's used uh, the longest in China. Uh, so this guy, he was doing all kinds of things. Um, this is two of his uh, devices. So this is kind of like the hemispherium they were talking about, this, but this is really what's called an inverted uh, celestial sphere. So they could use this to determine times uh, of the, and positions of the moon, or sun, excuse me, and uh, some of the stars at night too. So you could do both on this thing. And then this one is a, again, the square table is what it was called. This thing was huge again. Uh, that's probably like a, I think it was like a, about five foot by five foot device on the bottom. And it went up, I forgot how tall it was. But you can tear, see it's got a gnomon on it. And uh, yeah, so this guy was, uh, so here's what I was talking about, the shadow definer. He helped, and it was built with a gnomon that was uh, at the Dangfeng uh, Star Observation Platform, wherever that, were, wherever that was built. It was the, yeah, the non, Hernan province with a 9.46 meter gnomon. That's a giant size gnomon. 9.46 meters? I was like, maybe they wrote that down. <laughs> maybe they meant to change that to 9.46 feet? I don't know, but that's a 27 foot tall, right? Or more, right? Uh, tall gnomon. That's a huge, huge gnomon. Anyway, uh, so I wrote it down the way they put it. So again, maybe the translation, there was a problem with that. So, but again, this guy was, uh, he, his time overlaps with this next one, which was the Yong, uh, Yuan, I think it is Yuan Dynasty. They promoted it a lot of uh, development. So they were building a lot of uh, observatories that came enhancing them kept building them more and more. Um, so, like I said, that guy created both of those, the inverted and the square table. But in the Ming Dynasty, which was right after the Yuan one, uh, they really kicked it up a level. They said, no, we really want to know all this information about the stars and the heavens. Uh, and uh, they uh, wanted this armillary to be a little bit simpler to use which is what he created here. Oops, I think I missed my, there we go. So this is supposed to be the simplified version of that other thing. Again, simplified and yet still so decorative, right? I love it. More dragons, not so many colors this time, but this is supposed to be the uh, simplified one. Uh, and again, this is government sponsored. We're gonna, you're gonna do it, you're gonna make it nice because it's gonna go towards our capital and such. So, that was during the Ming Dynasty. Then, the big daddy, or in my, my opinion, the big cat daddy here. This is the, uh, was built right in the heart of Beijing. So the capital ha at this time, uh, by this time in the uh, Chinese history, Beijing now has become the capital. So it's called the Center of Ancient Chinese Astronomy. Uh, so it was an observatory operated continuously for 500 years, until 1929. And uh, this is where, I, this is the museum I visited basically. This is the place I went to and found all this information about and this is where all the pictures come from. So, and some people know it as Purple Mountain. I've also heard, 
purple, uh, people call it the Purple Mountain Observatory, but uh, uh, I never did quite find that except for on Google Maps. Uh, it did show that it was maybe the Purple Mountain, so I'm not sure. But anyway, so you can see how big this thing is, this giant observatory. It's towering over the trees over there. That's me in front of the big giant lions again. I love the aesthetics, right? The, the culture comes through in their design and everything. The steps, killer steps for the person who had been walking around that day to a lot of uh, <laughs> temples, a lot of walking around downtown Beijing. It was really close to the Forbidden City. This isn't very far from the Forbidden City. So we had already walked through the Forbidden City. Uh, so when I saw that stairs, I'm like, you know what, this is astronomy related. I'm gonna go up them. So I did. But it was a little daunting to see those stairs at the first. I'm like, oh my God. But uh, so I did. Um, again, all the architecture still maintained that very um, ancient Chinese style of design. You can see the, the uh, tile, tile roof over there. The dragons carved into stone pieces everywhere. And right down here, uh, the, that good old circle door that I remember when I was a kid watching Kung Fu Theater. And you know, you'd have those circle doors, people walking through or jumping through half the time because they were doing Kung Fu stuff. And, I had my own personal guide, that's my wife there, but at that time, she didn't speak very much English, and I spoke as much Chinese now that I do as then, so I speak very little. Uh, but she, she, and she's not a museum lover, so I was the one taking pictures of the object and the placard because I knew I wouldn't have time to <laughs> sit there and just read it, so I don't know if any of you can relate to that, but I'm sure some of you might be able to, but uh, yeah, so, but she was helpful. There are times where I tried to ask her, but she tried to make it a translation, whether we used our phones, because a lot of times we were using our phone at that time to do uh, like Google translation. Um, so there was a little confusion though, because there was a placard that said this building was built in 1442. Most everything agreed that this whole place was built in 1442, but there was another placard that said parts of it were built in 1421 and it said observatory specifically. So I believe they were talking in 1421 that the smaller version, this smaller observatory was built there first. And then the rest of it was built in 1442. So about 20 years later, the rest of it was built around it. Uh, so that little, uh, I don't know if anybody can read the Chinese, my wife, I don't think she could read it either, but uh, whatever that says uh, is the label for that. And you can see how small this thing is. You can barely get probably one, maybe two people in that little thing. Uh, serious, it's, it would be really claustrophobic in there. Um, this, uh, this is another one of the things that was, uh, this armillary down here was again mentioned on that same placard of 1421, so that piece again might be, right? The, uh, the representation on this wall uh, are of tablets. That was from that 4000 to 5000 BCE, so obviously it's just a representation. And of course, the little black thing in that image over there is uh, there are constellations, which are obviously different. Every culture has their own constellations, but clearly that wasn't made back in ancient time because it has LEDs on it. <laughs> so uh, then uh, this, though, was supposedly uh, built again in 1421 because, again, when I read the description, it said three things were built an observatory, the, uh, the armillary sphere, I mean, yeah, the armillary sphere and the celestial sphere, okay, that, which is this piece down here. And you can see that the celestial sphere, the red, I believe, is the ecliptic. And someone might disagree or agree, I'm not sure. And then the yellow, I believe, is the uh, equatorial. So, uh, but it, this is a, uh, basically a representation of fixed stars that they used for referencing uh, stars in the heavens, okay? And so uh, they kept, and some of the other things that we'll look at later uh, kept very strict track of those specific stars, uh, their altitudes, their azimuths, all that, okay? Also, you notice, uh, again, one of those aesthetic things, the uh, bird down here is called the red bird. So they have different terms for their cardinal directions. Uh, so these little stone tablets had those um, uh, cardinal directions carved into them, but you can't really tell, which is why I just grabbed a generic image of it off the uh, off the web. Uh, but you can, uh, if you can read it, uh, so the east was called Kang Long, which is blue dragon. Uh, the south was Zhu Ku, 
uh, or the red bird, which is the one on the celestial sphere there. Uh, the west was represented by Bai Hu, which Bai is white, uh, so white tiger. And then the north was Zhuang, uh, Zhuang Mu, the black tortoise, which they need to make a better tortoise on that image, I think. It looks more <laughs> like a snapping turtle to me. So, but anyway. Uh, so they did. It was interesting, again, one of those cultural things where they just had the different directions. And, and uh, I would have loved to have seen these on the wall. Um, and here they're talking about 28 lunar lodges. I didn't dive into that. I don't know what that meant. So these also were used to indicate the 28 lunar lodges, whatever that is. I didn't look. So, uh, let's see. All right, so then we had this guy come along. Um, his name was Zhu Guanji, I think, or Guanchi, I think. Astronomer who worked with uh, a Jesuit uh, missionary. His name was Matteo Ricci. And he wrote, uh, the, the um, Zhu wrote what's called the Chongzhen Li Shu, which basically brought the Western knowledge uh, of astronomy that was available at this time. Now realize we're only up to 1543, right? Of rediscovery of all that ancient history, but they're at least getting some of the Western knowledge of, of, of <coughs> Uh, Euro uh, European style uh, astronomy, but he's now writing their, uh, basically a Chinese version of it and distributing it across the, the country so that people can uh, understand a little bit better. And then our, our kind of, we're almost to the end, folks, so again, I hope you haven't fallen asleep yet. Um, we get this uh, part, which is a lot of the giant instruments that you could see in that far away uh, image. 1673, so we're pretty far along, and I'm not going to go too much longer. Uh, I loved how it was contrasted, this ancient stuff being contrasted against the more modern sty uh, skyline of Beijing, which is why I took that picture. <laughs> uh, and then we kind of go through them, uh, the different things. So this is, a, the, again, this is where the, the translation of the placard versus what the device was, I think there was some kind of a miss. Uh, they just called this the alt azimuth. So I'm assuming that's what they used it for. That's basically what it said in the description. Used to discern the azimuth of celestial bodies. So I would assume you'd point it in some fashion at your target and you would be able to determine its azimuth. Uh, so I don't know if that was the right exact name for it. Uh, then you had this one, which is one of those armillary spheres. This one is the equatorial version of it. Um, it could also track true solar time, supposedly. All right, uh, help uh, with right ascension and uh, the difference, right ascension difference, which again, it was specifically written that way. Again, I don't know if that's a translation issue because I've never heard of a right ascension difference. Maybe between the sun and the, the other object, but how would you see the other object, right? <laughs> it's, it would be during the night. And declination, so again, Translation issues, problem. I love this giant sextant. It's a huge thing. It looked like a giant crossbow on top. I thought it was like a defense piece or something like that, but it is a sextant. It's an angular distance of any stars within 60 degrees of each other. It could determine where its, its position was. It also was used to uh, figure out the angular size of the sun and the moon. Oh, it's huge. Gorgeous though. Again, what you can see, all those dragon carvings on everything. Again, there's no reason why you add all the additional filigree, but why not? Let's make it look neat. Um, this is the ecliptic version of the armilla. armilla. Uh, so it looks almost identical, right? It is two Those are two actual different objects. Um, then you had another celest uh, celestial sphere. This one is giant. It's huge, uh, even bigger than the other one. The other one was about as big as these two tables together. This one was, you know, like part of the room here almost. It was huge. And you could see that it's got this little point here, clearly pointing towards Polaris. I don't know, I, actually I don't remember if it was uh, properly oriented at this time on top. Because a lot of this equipment was moved up there uh, when they turned this into a museum. So, because it is, it's no longer functioning as a observatory. So. Um, this is the one that really mystified me. This one's called the quadrant. 
And it was supposed to be used to help determine uh, altitudes uh, or zenith distances of celestial bodies. That was the quote again on the placard. So how would you use this to do that? And I wasn't quite sure. I mean, I didn't know if this central pillar here, right here, moved or something. I don't know. That one was a mystery to me. I still, today, have no idea how they use this thing to determine these, these things. So, and maybe it was incomplete. Maybe that's another thing, maybe. So, uh, this is an interesting one. It's called a theodolite. Again, terms that I had never heard before. It's attributed to astronomy, a theodolite, armillary. Those things were like, eh, never heard. Uh, so this is used to uh, determine both vertical and horizontal uh, uh, at the same time, angles at the same time. So you could use it to do both, which is a pretty cool device. Again, why so ornate? I don't know. I mean, again, is it functional? Probably, most likely. But why do all the extra you know, design elements? Beautiful. I thought they were beautiful. Okay, and I think we have our last slide coming up. So 1715, there was all actually only one piece up on the top which was from 1715, which was this guy. And this is uh, azimuth theodolite. So they, again, remember, they were always constantly improving and in innovating the way they could use the devices that they were creating. So this could uh, do both altitude and azimuth of the celestial bodies, uh, but it also clearly has like a sextant on the top as well. So uh, they were combining things together to make it more functional. But again, still ornate giant sized so uh yeah so that was it that's it uh any questions <laughs> no i kind of breezed through that fast and and uh, again this is my book report folks i hope you appreciate it <laughs> yeah go ahead question do, do you know was there any telescope or did you use of lenses or anything during this <sighs> you know i did not see that there i think this was all very you know visual just let's look at the sky and yeah we're not worried about telescopes until actually I do I did forget to point out one other point here this guy um, this is occurred in 1815 so we're quite a bit advanced in, in things here um, Lee Sean Lan is his name he worked with uh, John Frederick William Herschel uh, so one of the Herschels that uh, most people are well uh, I think it's his son I don't think it's the first Herschel. Uh, anyway, a Jesuit missionary called Alexander Wiley. Again, they're bringing uh, Western concepts of astronomy over to China. And Li Shanlan uh, uh, wrote his work called Talking About Skies. And again, distributed widely across uh, China. Uh, so I don't, I think at that time, maybe they would have brought over telescopes because by that time, right, Europe's fully engrossed in using telescopes to do all kinds of things, but at that, at that uh, museum, I did not see any. There was one other point I forgot to mention that while we were going through there. There was an a interesting factoid about one of the Chinese uh, astronomers, one of the things he came up with about the whole meridian thing that we were talking about earlier, longitude, latitude, and if you Google that same concept uh, uh, right now on Wikipedia, it comes up with, oh, that wasn't discovered until 1800, and yet they had done it back in 1350, you know, and it was an American on Wikipedia. Here, <laughs> like, well, so who gets the credit for that? Is it was it really found out in 1350 back in Chinese thing, or was it the the American sea captain? Maybe he just applied it to nautical use. That's right. I'm guessing. Any other questions? Sure, have, uh, do you know any association in America on this subject, the Chinese association, or the global association that we can network? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I did not look into that. I was wondering that myself, and I, I never did look into it. I just kind of got overwhelmed with well, the things I had to do. Out, right? Yeah, yeah, I would just Google. I would assume so. Uh, but, uh, and this was centered, this location, this museum was centered on ancient Chinese astronomy. This so, Beijing, right? yeah, right, right in the heart of Beijing, not too far south, uh, a little bit south, but not much, uh, but mostly east of uh, uh, 
the Forbidden City. It was like within 20 minutes at the most walking distance of the Forbidden City. I've been going to China since early 70s. I find it very interesting. Yeah, oh yeah. I was going to mention this place, this place is in the heart of uh, what they call the Hutong area. I don't know if anybody knows that, but uh, Hutong is basically old village, right? Uh, so it's all where all the older village uh, places you can stay at. We stayed at uh, one of the Hutong uh, hotels. Uh, the the, the, def, uh, the uh, sewer system definitely wasn't up to code. <laughs> so it was a kind of a stinky smell, or a stinky stay. But it was a beautiful building. I mean, seriously, it was just a gorgeous place. And it was definitely very authentic. It was an old village, and you could, uh, there, they had a shopping area that was right by, <coughs> down the street. And it was very neat, very interesting. But it, it, the, the, the museum was in the heart of the Hutong neighborhood as well, because it's old, you know, right by the Forbidden City. Any other questions? Yes? What kind of materials were those? Devices made from some kind of cast metal, or yeah, I think almost all of those were bronze. Bronze. Uh, yeah, almost all of them were bronze. Yeah, As the, with that green patina, it has to be bronze. Yeah, I didn't see much of anything else really. They were uh, unless it was stone, like a lot of the the uh, water things were uh, stone made. The calypso, calypsedra time thing and the even the, the rabbit one I don't know if that it was still mostly made of wood I mean uh, stone and then only a little bit of it was made of wood and it was bamboo which does last a long time if taken care of properly but no I think it was all bronze those big devices especially are there any gadgets like in America somewhere yeah I don't know about that I, that's why I said I've never heard of uh, armillary or theodolite or any of those terms, I was like, what is this thing? I have no idea. That's why, like I said, I took pictures of the placard because I had to read. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think it ever got, I don't think the knowledge went the other way. We, they took it from Western Europe and, and adopted the, the concepts that were coming to, uh, you know, to knowledge again. Um, but I don't know if the knowledge went the other way too. I don't think it did. Yes. How did you stumble upon this museum? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I well, uh, again, I was there to actually pick up my wife. Uh, this, uh, so I was like, you know what? I'm in China. I'm going to Google and see what I can find. Maybe there's an awesome observatory, especially in Beijing. You would assume there is, and actually, there's more than just this one. There is one I think that's still functioning, and then, uh, but it's probably more like Adler, where it's not going to be seen very much in the heart of Beijing. And then uh, I think there was even another one, but it was way the heck out uh, on the burbs. But anyway, so this is uh, just, I did a Google search. And I, and I started looking at the map of downtown Beijing because I knew I, we were staying in that Hutong Hotel. And I'm like, what is that? Ancient Chinese astronomy, there you go. That's me, I'm there. So yeah, that's all it is. <laughs> I just got lucky I, and uh, I was just absolutely loved it when I went there. Would yeah. you go back and view the other museums that you were talking about? Yeah, definitely. I would actually I'd like to even go back to this one to do a little bit better photography for one and then also to do uh, a little bit more information gathering on some of the placards I didn't take. It. I didn't start taking pictures of the placards early enough. I should have taken them right away so I probably would have got a bigger timeline of the Chinese stuff. So, yeah. Go ahead. Um, one of the things that I was curious about is do they approach visitors in the same way as you know, museums in the U.S. do, where they have education, a gift shop, and or you know, AV type things where you can experience the sky. Yeah, that's this a, location. Okay, so I think my experience was a little jaded in that because um, I just use the word jade. Sorry, Chinese <laughs> jade. They like to do. My wife loves her jade. Uh, sorry, uh, but. We went, my wife and I, we were during the week. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we did ask someone, I don't remember who it was we asked, but they said this place normally would be a lot more busy on the weekend. I know she and I talked about one of the uh, parks that we went to during that same, I think it was either that same day or the next day. Uh, we went to the park and I was like, this isn't too crowded, considering it's Beijing, right? 25 million or however many it is. And, uh, she said, well, yeah, but it's the work day. So it was a work day. 
Um, in this museum, I did not see a gift shop specifically, and if it was, it was really tiny. There was a few pamphlets, uh, like where that, they had that placard of the old poem and uh, the uh, smaller armillary. Uh, there was a few pamphlets, but there wasn't like a charge I just, that we saw. There were other places that were more commercialized uh, that we went to. There was a uh, arboretum we went to that had more of the American style, uh, uh, you know, museum feel, where you would, you know, you had to pay for an audio thing if you wanted to hear what you were looking at, and uh, so. But at this place, it was the ancient Chinese, so I think they kind of wanted to keep it in that uh, mindset. It seemed like because it, there wasn't even any attendant that we could tell. We just, they, we walked in and just did our thing. We wandered around, there was other people, very few people, there's maybe, I want to say there's like 10, 15 people at the most, including us, you know? So that, and again, maybe just because it was a work day, but it just didn't seem like it was very highly, I mean, the picture where I was standing in front of the, uh, the two lions is the closest a car was parked to it. So uh, there wasn't even really a good parking spot for this place. It wasn't very commercialized. That place one. Other places, yeah. Any other questions? No? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.